National Commissioner of Police Kefla Sitole admitted to Parliament in October 2018, and his exact words were that the SAPS is overstretched and it is impossible for them to fulfill their constitutional mandate. The South African government has proposed legislative changes which will prohibit the use of firearms for purposes of self-defense. What are the implications of this for ordinary citizens looking to protect themselves? Well, I'm joined today by Khiren Jaber, who is a security specialist and an expert on firearms. Khiren, welcome to the CRA channel. Could you tell our viewers what are the details of these proposed amendments to the Firearms Control Act and how will they affect gun owners in South Africa? It's uh, the changes that are proposed are extremely broad. So I'm, I'm going to give you a very big picture overview and perhaps just focus on one of the more important and visceral aspects. So apart from prohibiting self-defense as a reason to own a firearm in South Africa, those sections of the Farms Control Act, section 13 and 14 specifically, are entirely repealed by these proposed amendments, which means that you will no longer be able to license a firearm for self-defense at all. There's also a, a general crippling of uh, hunting and sport shooting by similar amendments to such an extent that uh, those industries and sectors will be uh, destroyed in all but name. There are a host of ill thought through additional restrictions and amendments to, to sections throughout this entire document. So if we had to discuss those alone, we'd be here for, for about a week. But the one that has so far elicited the, the most visceral reaction from society was the prohibition of self-defense as a reason to own a firearm, especially since South Africa, and, and this will tie into to the rest of the discussion, South Africa is the sixth most homicidal nation on earth. Our murder rate has increased year on year since 2011. We have approximately between 40 and 50,000 cases of sexual violence and rape reported every year. And it's generally accepted that this is a very underreported statistics, obviously estimates to how badly underreported it is very quite widely. But what is evident from, from these cold statistics is the fact that South Africans are a population that live under siege from violent interpersonal contact crime with the poorer communities much worse affected than the more affluent and they are also the people who have traditionally turned to a form of basic farm ownership out of desperation more readily because the policing resources do not exist in their communities to keep them safe. I mean, the, the Commission on Policing in Kailicha that ran for quite a while and, and that came to a, a very unillustrious end is, is just a single example of the, the significant uh, nature of that problem. Enjoying this analysis? Click here to sign up for our 30-day free trial for more content from the CIA. The SAPs themselves have admitted that they are suffering from capacity problems. Uh, in the absence of the police's ability to enforce and protect the rights of citizens, what other recourse do citizens have? Uh, so it seems to us at the center that this represents a risk in terms of the basic ability of the state to uphold law and order. It, it re represents a massive and material risk to individual citizens in this, for the simple reason that the National Commission of Police, Kekla Sitole, admitted to Parliament in October 2018, and his exact words were that the SAPS is overstretched and it is impossible for them to fulfill their constitutional mandate. It's just important for me, uh, adding from the Secretariat and from the Minister, I still want to repeat the chapter 12 NTP caption due to the, the collapse of the national crime prevention strategy, the SAPs became an all-purpose agency with an overstretched mandate impossible to fulfill. It's still standing like that in the NTP. So I want to repeat the SAPs mandate is overstretched. Two, it's impossible to fulfill. We have, and I might be slightly wrong with this, but for at least three years in a row have had consecutive budget cuts for the South African police service amounting to billions of rands. Whereas at the same time, the VIP protection side of things have, have had budget increases perversely, which does rather cynically illustrate where the politicians, uh, their priorities are lying with us. But 
again, the, the risk to the average citizen is your, your last resort of projecting force in order to save your life and the lives of people that you very much care about from violent criminal attack is now being removed from you. And the only way in future, if this bill is passed, that you will be able to exercise that ability is to do so unlawfully, which has the perverse outcomes of protecting criminals from the consequences of their trade and turning everyone who into an unwilling victim of crime who's incapable of defending themselves. One of the problems that I've heard identified with the proposed laws is that any amnesty process that would necessarily be required for this law to take effect could mean that many thousands of firearms might actually slip into the wrong hands. Uh, we've seen instances of firearms being, as part of the amnesty process, being pilfered and the SAPs not actually being able to control and secure those firearms. Uh, what other risks do you, do you see emerging of, of this kind? Well, that risk in itself is a very meaningful concern because even with the most latest amnesty, there have been numerous reports of firearms that were marked for destruction. They have been recovered from crime scenes around Cape Town. That, well, the, that's since I am a Cape Town native, that is the, the ones that or those are the incidents or examples that I am most exposed to and aware of. But it is most certainly a nationwide problem that the SAPs do not have the capacity to look after the firearms that are handed into their, their custody. I mean, their own firearm permit system, which keeps track of the roughly half a million SAPs firearms have been switched off since, I think, June or July last year due to non-payment of a service provider. Even though that funding was ring-fenced, the Minister of Police has failed to actually act on it. And that has resulted in the integrity of those firearms being compromised, criminally compromised. So it is not, I don't think saying that this may happen is, uh, is quite strong enough. I think it's an absolute certainty that a vast number, a significant number of firearms handed into the police or seized in the wake of, of these amendments being passed, should they be passed, is, is a very real concern and it's, it's a pretty much a guarantee. Gideon, what other alternatives do we have in terms of appropriate regulation of firearms for citizens? There, there is quite a few proposed solutions that are practical and implementable with almost immediate effect. The major issues with the current system is it is overly heavy on administration paperwork. It is completely opaque and not transparent. And these two factors combine to mean that it's a system that is very easily captured by criminal elements within the police, cooperating with criminal elements outside the police. It's prone to corruption, inefficiency. There's a whole host of problems. What we have suggested for, I think, the past 20 years, and that was a recent Dear South Africa campaign, which is currently also running a online public participation effort uh, against this bill where, well, all for it if you, if you are swinging that way to have your voice heard. But what we are proposing is that we treat firearms essentially the same way we treat vehicles and automobiles, where you as the natural person become the license holder and license party once you are vetted to be an appropriate fit and proper person. And your firearms are then registered to your name, much like your vehicles would be registered to your name electronically preferably without getting too technical on something like a distributed or decentralized public ledger, similar to a type of blockchain, which means every single part of the so-called transaction can be tracked from origin to end without being uh, the capacity for someone on the inside to interfere and duplicate it. A big part of this would to remove the responsibility of foreign licensing from the police in its entirety and give it to an appropriate independent body to do with the police than merely acting as auditors or uh, an oversight body to ensure that the process complies with the law as written. Gideon, what can ordinary citizens who are concerned about these proposed amendments do to let their voice be heard? There are a few things they can do, and, and one that I would encourage them to definitely take up is to use the DRSA platform uh, as a, there is presently a public participation campaign and effort running on there pertaining to these amendment bills. And what happens is every single submission that is done via DRSA is emailed in legal format to the originator, which is the Civilian Secretariat of Police. And at the same time, it's also recorded, counted and tracked on the DRSA website and database. That means that government can't turn around after the 45 day period is over and say, well, we've only received X amount of submissions. 
because we know exactly the number of submissions that have gone through the DRSA portal. We know who they're from and what was said in them and what the, what, what, um, the on the drop down menu, which choices were made by those individuals. So that is a way of keeping government accountable in a transparent way. Khirin Jaber, thank you very much. We'll put a link to the Dear SA public consultation page in the pinned comment and also in the description. We'll also link to Paratus, which is Khirin's YouTube channel. My name is David Ansara. This is the Center for Risk Analysis. Please leave your comments in the comment section below. What do you think will be the impact of this proposed change on gun ownership in South Africa?